Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? If you keep up with computer technology, you probably know that most smartphones and tablets these days run ARM-based CPUs. But a recent report suggests that Apple might be moving its Mac line up to that platform. I can't help but wonder if this wouldn't have some potentially interesting effects on the industry as a whole. So rumors have been swirling about Apple potentially switching Macs to the ARM-based platform for years now. It's largely just been speculation based on Apple's actions and the way that its products have evolved, especially with the advancements in performance of Apple's own designed CPUs that it uses in iPhones and iPads, that sort of thing iPhones, the latest iPhones are actually very well performing. And if you look at some of the benchmarks, they're on par with some of Intel's own consumer focused CPUs. So that's led a lot of people to think at some point, Apple is going to at least switch Macs from Intel CPUs to ARM based ones, if not potentially just merge the entire product lineup under iOS and Macs would effectively just be iPads with keyboards or something like that. Well, the softer side of it, I think is best safe for another discussion, but a relatively recent report from Bloomberg actually gives a little bit more concrete evidence as to what may be going on. And in that report, it basically says that Apple is investigating using its own chips based on the ARM platform in Macs starting in the year 2020, effectively kicking Intel to the curb. And while this is the first bit of concrete information that we've actually gotten about some sort of initiative like that, the fact that it came from a larger news outlet like Bloomberg and not just some random Mac rumors blog out on the internet gives a bit of credence to it. So much so that in fact that day Intel stock dropped almost 10%. Even though Apple is a relatively small customer to them, what I read is that Intel is only, or Apple rather, is only about 5% of Intel's market share, like in terms of customers. So they're a relatively small player, but that news was enough to really startle investors in a decent way. So I figured let's take a look at this whole situation, kind of unpack it, see where we've been and potentially where we're going and whether the overall reaction to that news is necessarily going to live up to the potential hype that it's generated. So we've seen transitions from Macs in terms of their CPUs before. In fact, Apple has done it twice. In 2005, Apple switched from the PowerPC platform to Intel's x86 platform. And it came at a time that was really opportunistic for Apple. PowerPC development has had really started to hit a wall at that point in terms of extracting more performance per watt, uh, getting more efficiency out of the CPU, being able to get the thing to go faster in various form factors. Uh, the G5 was the latest series of CPU that Apple used that were PowerPC based in its Macs, but those were limited to desktops. Apple was never able to get a G5 based laptop out in the field simply because the CPUs required too much power, they ran too hot. In fact, Apple's last generation Power Mac G5, the big tower that kind of looks like the cheese grater thing, that dual CPU version of that ran so hot, those machines came from the factory with a water cooling setup. Now that water cooling setup proved problematic in its own right, but that's just how hot and power hungry the PowerPC platform had gotten at that point with the pursuit of performance in mind. So when Apple switched to Intel, it gained two things. One, it gained an immediate fix to a problem that it had. Intel CPU simply ran significantly cooler, significantly less power. There were mobile variants that also offered better performance than what the G4 could do for Apple's laptop lineup. So it was a good immediate fix to that problem. The other thing though that switching to Intel did for Apple was a better long-term solution. Intel had a much better looking roadmap. 
at the time of the transition, uh, uh, Intel had just launched its core series of CPUs. And those offered multi-core performance. It was a good, solid architecture with a long roadmap out in front of it. In fact, that original core series of CPUs is really what kind of underpins today's core series. Intel has just kept iterating off of that. So today's latest core i series of CPUs can trace their roots back to those original core CPUs from 2005. So that was an investment and a bet that really paid off for Apple. And it was an interesting transition and it was an interesting announcement. I remember when Apple announced that it was going to happen. People had been, you know, kind of like now with going to ARM, people, you know, had generated rumors about Apple potentially moving to x86, but it had always been one of those, yeah, I don't know, maybe not, I don't think so kind of scenarios where everyone figured, you know, it'd be too much work, it'd be too big of a switch in terms of architecture, too much work to do, too much disruption and everything. And then Apple went and did it, and it surprised everyone. Actually, I remember what really surprised everyone the most wasn't necessarily the change in hardware, but rather the fact that Apple had been compiling its Mac OS X operating system internally for years on the x86 platform. So every time Apple released publicly a new version of, of OS X for PowerPC, it had also done an internal build of that same version for x86 and managed to keep that secret for several years. So that transition went really smoothly overall. Apple had designed a whole bunch of new hardware around those CPUs. Some of it looked the same, some of it looked different, but it overall was a really good kick in the pants for the Mac platform and in some ways brought it into better feature parity with what PCs, traditional PCs offered at the time. It was a bet that really well paid off. Granted, Apple wasn't going to do it as a single cut, right? It wasn't just like, hey, going forward, we're only doing this Intel thing. And if you bought a PowerPC based Mac yesterday, well, sucks to be you. A Apple had a long term transition plan behind it. And this is going to be an important fact to keep in mind. So for years after Apple started selling these Intel-based machines, it still offered support for the PowerPC-based ones. It still offered PowerPC versions of its software, whether it's the operating system or the add-on apps that run on top of it that Apple itself sold. It had a really good transition plan for developers, and a point that we'll get to later is how you got your older PowerPC apps to continue to run on your new Intel system even before the software developer may have had time to recompile it or rewrite it, whatever they needed to do. So overall, it was a generally really well done transition. The thing though is people also tend to forget that Apple had done a similar transition once prior. The Intel transition wasn't the first and only time Apple had ever done it. Apple actually had some experience with transitioning CPUs. In, in the early 90s, Apple moved from the Motorola 68000 or 68K series of CPUs to the then relatively new PowerPC series. And it was for very, very similar reasons. 68K was kind of coming up against a wall. There was really not that much farther that Motorola could push that architecture. And the PowerPC platform simply looked like the better option over the long term. Yeah, it would cause some pain for people in the short term while they transitioned, but overall it would be a net gain. And that ended up being the case. The PowerPC was a significantly faster platform in the long run than the Motorola 68000 series, and it was a bet that paid off. Apple, obviously any company doing a major transition like that is going to do its homework to make sure that it's not just going to end up having to either eat its words or undo it or do another transition shortly thereafter if it just didn't work out. What's interesting though with the PowerPC side of things during that transition was it wasn't as clean of a cut. When Apple went to Intel, it was basically like a look in a very short period of time, we're gonna stop selling anything that has PowerPC in it and everything going forward is gonna have Intel in it. I, If memory serves, it was only about a year. I think that there was overlap between 
machines that have PowerPC CPUs in them and all of them getting replaced with Intel versions. I, I, I'm trying to remember, I don't have the history up in front of me, but I'd like to say it was a relatively short period of time, about a year at the most, where Apple had machines with both CPUs like sitting on the shelf in stock ready to buy. With the 68K to PowerPC transition, that went over all a bit longer. I remember Apple releasing the new PowerPC machines and then right alongside them continuing to release new 68K based machines. It seemed like it was gonna be more of a stepped type of transition for them where they advertise the PowerPC based machines as being the higher end models. If you wanted a really fast Mac, go buy one of these machines, which they just called the Power Mac series. And for everybody else, if you were more consumer focused, you just wanted a, a decent solid computer for at home or for computer labs at schools or whatever, then the 68K machines were good choices and there were models in that lineup as well. Of course, over the long term, Apple moved everything to the PowerPC platform, but it wasn't nearly as quick as it was moving from PowerPC to Intel. But the key to making both of these transitions happen was the fact that because Apple controlled both the hardware and the software, it's, and it still does, it operates everything as a complete package, it was able to integrate software emulation in as part of the transition. So when you went from 68K to PowerPC, obviously when all of those new PowerPC systems first came out, the vast majority of software on the market, including large portions of the actual Mac OS code base for the OS itself, were all written with 68K in mind. So day one, Apple needed the ability to run 68K apps on PowerPC. The PowerPC hardware itself was not backward compatible with 68K code. You couldn't just run 68K code on a PowerPC CPU. You needed some sort of translation layer in there. So Apple included an emulator that managed to switch between native PowerPC code when there was native PowerPC code to be run and emulating 68 code into PowerPC instructions so that the computer could run it. So day one, the vast majority of the Mac OS and a lot of programs were actually being emulated. The reason why all of that worked, and it's the same thing with the Intel side of things, right? With, when we went to Intel, yeah, Apple had been compiling the Mac OS for Intel for quite a while, but there was still tons of software out there that was written for PowerPC that hadn't been translated to Intel when those new machines dropped. Apple did the same thing with a translation, emulation, whatever layer called Rosetta that would take that code converted on the fly. The reason Rosetta worked, the reason why the 68K to PowerPC translation layer worked is because the target CPU was significantly faster than the previous one. PowerPC was quite a bit faster than 68K. Intel CPUs were a decent bit faster than PowerPC CPUs you're always going to lose performance when you're doing software emulation like that. And remember, there's a difference between software emulation and virtualization. Virtualization is just when you're running kind of like sandboxed or containerized code on the same platform. Virtualization is when you're translating from one to the other. If you're really big into gaming, trying to put all this into perspective, you can think of an emulator for game consoles along the same lines, right? you want to play a Super NES game on your Intel-based Windows PC. You're not going to be virtualizing the game because it was designed to run on a different CPU architecture than what your current computer has in it, so you're going to be running an emulator, translating all that code from effectively one language to another. But it always slows things down when you do that. Apple managed to make it work simply because the newer machines were always quite a bit faster than the previous ones. So it... It was a good bridge, it worked. In the worst case scenario, generally things were about the same speed as they were before if you were running software on a new machine. But most people didn't necessarily notice that because other parts of the system did run faster. And as time went on and software developers either recompiled or rewrote their programs for the new architectures, performance increased substantially. Intel native apps on Macs now run just incredibly fast compared to when they were on PowerPC. 
And even when you looked at the time during that transition, Intel Macs simply booted. They booted the OS significantly faster than the PowerPC-based ones, even though the hard drive speed and RAM speed hadn't really changed a substantial amount. I remember the very first Intel Mac that I used. It had one of the core Duo CPUs in it, and it blew my mind just how fast that machine just booted up compared to an equivalent PowerPC-based machine. So the emulation layer worked, and it was an overall net benefit, net positive, for end users. So that brings us to talking about this ARM transition. And what I've seen, what I've read, what I've heard from people is that there's actually quite a bit of excitement about it. A lot of people seem to be really stoked about Apple potentially moving to ARM for a few reasons. The, the first thing is that it's gonna yield a lot better power efficiency. I mean, if you look at the benchmarks like we talked about before, some ARM-based CPUs being used in mobile devices offer equivalent performance to Intel consumer-based CPUs like Core i5s and stuff like that. There are some iPads and iPhones that will benchmark at very similar performance numbers to Apple's MacBook lineup. And so if you think about you know, how much battery life you get out of a mobile device like an iPhone or an iPad compared to a laptop, there's immediately going to be a big savings in terms of battery life. Batteries on laptops, if they switch to ARM, are going to last a decent amount better. They're gonna run cooler. It's overall gonna be a much smoother experience for that type of use case. And as the world becomes increasingly mobile, I think a lot of targets are being set for what's the best net benefit that can be given to the laptop market. We'll talk about desktops and, and all that in a little bit. So right off the bat, people are just thinking, wow, the battery in my laptop, if Apple switches to ARM, it'll last quite a bit longer. And I agree, that is something worth getting excited about. Another thing is that it'll be a unified architecture between Apple's Mac lineup at that point and Apple's mobile lineup. So it'll be the same underpinnings generally for iPhones and iPads and laptops, potentially desktops. So that makes makes writing code a bit easier. You really only need to compile your app once, potentially for both iOS and macOS. And the only real difference you have to keep in mind between the two is just the user interface. You don't have to worry about two separate versions of the app, developing them as separate things, like an iPad version of an app versus a Mac version of an app. You can consolidate development down, it'll save you time, it'll make your app be able to respond to changes quicker, you can implement features faster in it, all this kind of net benefit type of stuff. So overall, it'll make lives easier, things easier in the lives of software developers if they've got a single platform ultimately that they need to code for with just some minor differences based on the operating system. It also, and this is perhaps the, the big thing though, is it'll let Apple move forward with new products on its own terms. Right now, on the Mac side of things, Apple really gets held up by Intel. So Intel's new release cycle for CPUs generally dictates when Apple can release new Mac products. Like most PC manufacturers, it's not gonna keep releasing new iterations of products based on the same CPUs because people are like, well, you know, what's really the big difference, right? So Apple has always been held up by Intel, just like the rest of the PC market. And some of this isn't unique just to Apple either. The rest of the PC market sometimes gets held behind because Intel is slow to develop a new architecture or it's running behind on releasing a new iteration of a CPU lineup or something like that. And it all they can do is just kind of sit there and be like, well, you know, as soon as Intel gets us these parts, then we can launch our fancy new products. So Apple has always been held up by Intel in one way or another. And so by moving to Apple designed CPUs, suddenly that's no longer a factor. As soon as Apple iterates and comes up with the next great you know, generation of ARM-based CPUs that it wants to use in its Mac products, it can go ahead and launch those products and not really have to rely on anybody. It can also custom tailor those CPUs for its products. Maybe there are certain attributes to CPUs that are really beneficial 
for a laptop or desktop lineup, and then other attributes that are really only good for mobile devices and maybe not so much for laptops and desktops. Apple can custom build CPUs exactly how it needs them to be to target what product it wants to put them in. And it's already been doing this sort of thing with the iPad and iPhone lineup, building in certain features and functionality, uh, the whole hybrid CPU approach where Apple has a couple of really fast CPU cores and a couple of slower and much lower power CPU cores that it can dynamically switch between in the iPhone. That's a really good way to get you good performance when you need it, but when you don't need it, save you a bunch of battery life. Features like that are ones that Apple can custom tailor for its products that another manufacturer may not necessarily be able to do so easily. Intel is going to be more of a one-size-fits-all kind of approach across its product lineup because it's not going to custom spin CPUs just for Apple considering how relatively small of a customer they are to Intel. So lots of excitement potentially for Apple moving to ARM on the Mac lineup. And I generally don't really have any huge worries about that transition if it were to happen. I, I don't think it's going to kill the Mac. I don't think it's going to send people running away in droves. If anything, it may actually help bring more people to the Mac platform if you look at the spec sheet and go, oh, wow, this laptop has you know 50% more battery life than an Intel-based competitor or something like that. You know, although it performs twice as fast or 50% as fast or whatever, you know, those could all be major draws to bring even more people onto Apple's, you know, product ecosystem. But I do have some concerns because while this on its face seems like it could just be another kind of regular transition of CPUs for Apple, at the same time, there are some key differences. So the first one is that that emulation layer part that we were talking about probably would need to happen going from Intel to ARM. Chances are all the software developers are not going to have ARM optimized or compiled versions of its software for Mac OS on day one when Apple launches those new products, if it ever does. So there's going to need to be some sort of transition period with an emulation layer. Now, while ARM CPUs generally have shown to be really good performers watt for watt compared to the x86 platform, they're not that much farther ahead, right? We're not really at the point where ARM CPUs are clearly like the future and everyone needs to get rid of x86 right now and move to them. It's not that huge of a performance improvement. Can there be a big performance improvement over time? Yes, but it's not dramatic. It's not like Intel has crap slow CPUs, Intel is still iterating. It's still advancing the x86 platform. The latest generation of core CPUs are really fast, especially as Intel has been putting more cores into the CPU package. Like we're seeing six core CPUs for laptops from Intel now, and that's really produced compelling numbers. So ARM isn't going to be that much faster than Intel. So the question is, what kind of performance impact are we going to potentially see out of that emulation layer? Is it going to be equivalent performance going from Intel to ARM, or could you actually see a performance hit? Could it be like, hey, if you go out and buy this fancy new ARM-based Mac, your app will perform a third slower than it did when you were on your older Intel-based Mac. That's a real possibility, and that's going to be something that could keep people from wanting to buy a new ARM-based Mac right away, or at least present a major struggle for Apple to overcome in terms of pushing software developers to recompile their apps or rewrite their apps, whatever they need to do. You know, maybe Apple needs to do some sort of financial incentive for software developers or give them a really long lead time to help them make that transition. Some of that kind of stuff is already in the works. There's something called Project Marzipan, I believe is what it's referred to internally. These are all kind of rumors still going on as well. But Apple, I think, is kind of starting to seed software developers in that direction of writing hybrid apps that'll work both on 
the Mac OS and on iOS. Granted, they still have to be two different processor architectures, but you know, we can, we can kind of get there, right? I think maybe that could be a challenge during that transition, although it's one that can in some ways be a little bit mitigated. The other big one though is going to be the loss of compatibility. And this is where I think we're going to see some, some real kind of heartache going on amongst the Mac faithful, or at least the, the diehard users, the power users. This is one that would potentially impact me as well, where when you went you know, with a 68K based Mac or a PowerPC based Mac, you always kind of knew that you were buying a, a relatively unique machine, that it was gonna be kind of just its own thing and you relied entirely on Apple for pretty much everything and Apple called all the shots and you were going to buy a Mac and it was gonna be a Mac, right? You bought a Mac and it ran the Mac OS and it ran Mac OS apps on it and if you wanted to run or write an app for that computer, you you know had to write it specifically for Mac OS, that sort of thing. Moving to Intel though was really interesting because, and this ended up being kind of the butt of some jokes around that time, Apple hardware at that point really just kind of turned into regular PC hardware. Not to say that Apple was going out and buying regular motherboards off of PC vendors and sticking them in, you know, fancy looking chassis and all that. Apple still did some custom engineering, but the architecture was the same to the point where Apple introduced a technology called Boot Camp that let you dual boot your Mac with either OS X or Windows. And because it was all x86 based CPUs, it also opened the door for virtualization. And this is where it starts to affect me because at work I use a MacBook Pro, but I also do an awful lot of work on the Windows side of things. So all day I'm not just doing work on the Mac OS side, but I'm running a Windows virtual machine so I can do all of that work. It ends up being a really, really convenient setup for me because I only need one computer to kind of live in two different worlds. And that ended up being, I think, a major draw for a lot of other people too. I think there were a lot of people that were on the fence thinking, boy, you know, I'd really like to use a Mac. I'd like to learn about this whole Mac thing. The hardware looks really solid and it looks like a, an OS that I could be effective and efficient with, but they still needed to support Windows. They still needed to support other operating systems. So before the transition to Intel, people would have to basically have two computers. They could have a Mac, but then if they wanted to run Windows, they'd need a PC. When that transition happened and Macs effectively just became PCs in one way or another, that opened the door. Apple was able to gain a lot more people potentially because they could just do everything on one platform, however they wanted to do it. And that's at an OS level. From a software level, it also made things easier too, because Mac OS had always been based, or like Mac OS 10, the newer stuff, had always been based on BSD, which is a variant of Unix, and Unix and Linux are kind of similar. And Apple actually contributes back into the open source community with some of the stuff that it develops for the Mac OS, and the open source community is able to take that code and directly integrate it into other things because it's all based on the same platform. It makes life a lot easier. So both, there's a lot of sharing, both directions can help. There are times when I've needed a piece of software to run on the Mac that hasn't already been written, but I found it as an open source project for a Linux distribution or a Unix distribution, something like that. And I was able to easily just compile it into a Mac app and run it without having to recode, redesign, do any major amounts of work. It was really as simple as just download the project from GitHub and run it through Xcode or run it through Mac ports or whatever and build it and hey, boom, done, there it is, it works. Moving to ARM, it's not gonna be quite that simple. There's not gonna be as much sharing back and forth. If now you've got Macs kind of kicked out and, and being in their own island again, and especially the people who want to run Bootcamp or Windows or another OS in a virtual machine, now, is that even going to be possible? Is there going to be a way to do emulation in there that doesn't suck all the performance out of the computer? 
emulation for Windows on Mac used to exist and it was horrible. There was a product called Virtual PC that ran on PowerPC based Macs that let you run Windows and it was slow. It was ridiculously slow. Nobody really wanted to do it. Virtualization was so much better. Are we going to go back into that era? Is Apple going to become more closed off when it switches to ARM, if it switches to ARM, than it did when it moved to Intel? It actually became more open around that time. So some, some major concerns there. The other thing, though, is what is going to happen to the people who need that really, really high power? Is Apple even going to be able to push ARM as far far or as fast as Intel has with its CPUs. I mean, ARM has been around as a processor architecture for a very long time, but it seems like it's only been in the past half decade or so that they've really started to design those CPUs for performance. Previously, it was generally you picked ARM because it was a low power chip. It was great for small handheld mobile devices where you needed some computational power, but you didn't need the full power of a proper computer, a proper PC. It was more like you wanted to get good battery life out of your device. So there is arguably less development time with performance in mind on the ARM side of things than there is on Intel side of things, because Intel has always had the strive for more performance throughout its you know, decades of CPU design history. So would Apple or any other manufacturer that makes chips based on the ARM platform really be able to crank out CPUs that could compete with say a Core i7 or a Xeon or something like that for those people who would need a higher performing desktop or laptop. I'm not so sure, especially since 2020 really isn't that much, isn't that far away from now. Yeah, I know that there is definitely some places that ARM CPUs can go and who knows, maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff in the works that we just haven't seen yet because everyone's just focused on mobile devices that have ARM in them. M maybe it's gonna be trivial for them to push that that performance envelope that much farther, but it is something to think about. Now, on the flip side, and I know that this episode has largely been talking about Apple, it really isn't just about Apple though. And I think that's potentially why Intel's stock dropped that about 10% on the day that Bloomberg news article came out, despite the fact that Apple is a relatively small customer is because it's starting to put some writing on the wall. It's starting to put some real heat on Intel because Apple isn't the only company that's had its major operating system run potentially on ARM. It's, it, I should back up a sec. So OS 10 is the BSD based OS that was based on Next Step when Apple got Steve Jobs back and everything in the late 90s. Anyway, iOS, and watch OS and TV OS, all the other, you know, products that Apple makes for mobile devices, the ARM based stuff, that's all based on OS 10. That's all based on that kernel. Now, now they call it Mac OS for naming reasons, but it's all based on that same code base. And Apple isn't the only company to take its main code base and kind of fork it to a different platform like that. Microsoft has done the same thing. The most recent example is Windows RT for that kind of short-lived Surface RT tablet. And supposedly Windows is gonna be kind of going back, it died down for a little while, it's supposedly kind of going back in that direction again with Windows for you know ARM-based devices. Now there is a little bit of a difference in that if Apple takes Macs to ARM, it's not likely going to be running both of them in parallel. It's not like you're going to have ARM based Macs and Intel based Macs for sale at the same time, like forever. It's likely going to be, hey, yeah, we're not selling Intel anymore and it's all ARM. With Microsoft, there aren't really that strong signs that they're just going to dump Intel. Partially because Microsoft has had this history of wanting to support software for a very long time. It knows that some of its customers, especially its business customers, are fairly slow moving. And so they can't necessarily get all of their custom programs and everything that they use as part of their business 
up to date or changed all that quickly. So, you know, potentially, if Windows goes ARM, it's not necessarily going to be a whole, yeah, Microsoft is done with Intel and now it's ARM all the way. That would largely be a parallel sort of situation, kind of like what it was with that Surface RT tablet. That does cause some consumer confusion because you would like, you know, go buy one of those ARM based tablets thinking it's Windows. It looks just like Windows, but suddenly like half of your programs don't work because, well, they're not compiled to run on ARM. So it's it's an interesting scenario for Microsoft, very much different in some ways than Apple, but it still also sends a signal that Microsoft is even looking at moving to ARM for you know, a potentially long period of time, that, that it even tried that whole Surface RT thing, which ended up kind of being an experiment more than anything else, but it puts some heat on Intel. It puts some heat on Intel that it really needs to start working harder at innovation. Now, that's an interesting statement to make because and, and a lot of kind of armchair quarterback types are just saying, well, Intel's sitting there being lazy. I don't think Intel's sitting there being lazy at all. CPU development has simply just become harder. It's harder to extract more performance out of CPUs, at least on the x86 platform. There's an episode I did about the future of CPUs. I'll include a card to it up above. It kind of talks more about the differences between, say, ARM CPUs and Intel CPUs and how their history evolved and, and you know, what the, the future lies for each. But what I think it does signal to Intel is that they need to start thinking in different directions. They can't just keep going down the the current road that they are of, well, let's just try and get better speeds out of the CPUs. Let's just push them faster or throw more cores in there. Let's just try to keep iterating on it. I think what Intel needs to start thinking about is maybe it needs to make a radical shift. Maybe it needs to start designing a whole new CPU architecture and for their benefit, they would be best off designing it in such a way that there is some level of backward compatibility to it or the ability to have backward compatibility for a while. Maybe some kind of hybrid CPU where it's got a traditional x86 you know, core or a couple of cores on it alongside maybe a couple of cores of whatever new architecture they were to come up with. It ultimately kind of comes down to Intel's own survival. That's really what Intel is known for is CPUs. It can't lean on x86 forever. Itanium was pretty much a flop, at least in terms of the mass market. I'm surprised Itanium lasted as long as it did, quite frankly, mostly just because a couple of really big businesses bought into it and they just kept having to be supported. So it's, it's not just an Apple thing. While this story is really about Apple, and as we've seen a lot of times in the last decade or so, actually more than a decade out of Apple, two decades now probably, um, Apple is kind of the trendsetter. It's, it's forging that path forward, saying, you know what, we don't care what the rest of the industry is doing. We're going to do our own thing. And if anybody else is, is brave enough, they can follow us. They've done that before, and they'll continue to do that. But it ends up being an industry-wide thing and not just Apple. If Apple is brave enough to dump Intel in its entirety because Intel just isn't innovating as fast as it needs or not producing the products that it otherwise wants, well, you know, that could push some other manufacturers to go in that same direction. Anyway, I am curious, of course, as to your thoughts. This has been a little bit of a longer episode, especially given the kind of topic, but I know I've got some viewers who are, you know, diehard Mac users and others who are very attuned to the computer industry in general. What do you think about all of this? I mean, what do you think about Apple potentially switching to ARM? What do you think about the rest of the industry switching to ARM? What do you think about, you know, maybe mainstream computing products just going away from Intel and x86 entirely? What is that transition going to do for AMD as well? Is it going to maybe give AMD an opportunity, do you think? Maybe AMD, even though it's been kind of following Intel the entire time, maybe they'll read the writing on the wall sooner and start getting into new architectures and try to maybe beat Intel to the punch? Or do you think AMD is always just going to kind of stay behind and, and maybe focus less on its CPU side of things and, 
maybe push more into other technologies. I don't know. I'm just curious as to what you think. So be sure to leave your comments down below. Also, if you're interested in audio only versions of these podcasts, I have them available as plain MP3 downloads for supporters on my Patreon page. At any contribution level, you get access to those MP3 downloads. They usually go up a few days early before they show up on YouTube. And Patreon offers private RSS feeds, which is super cool. Just load it into the podcast player of your choice and the episode will show up automatically anyway just something to think about in any event if you like the episode i would appreciate a thumbs up be sure to subscribe if you haven't already you can follow me on twitter and instagram at this does not comp and as always thanks for watching